All right, welcome everyone. Um, this video, we're gonna take a look at more OneNote malware. And what caught my eye with this one is that uh, Emotet, here as you can see by submissions on the Malware Bazaar, um, has picked up using OneNote and resumed some activity here over the last few days, at least from the time of this recording. You want the TLDR, uh, these documents are gonna be structured with well, us, but there's probably two things. These documents are gonna be structured very similar to the other OneNote documents that we've analyzed. And if, you, if you're not sure about uh, I want to take a look at that analysis. I've got a couple of videos here. I'll, I'll add links to the video. Um, the other thing is if you've gone back maybe a year or two or three with analyzing Emotet, um, I think you'll see some pretty similar patterns in the, the scripts here that we'll, we'll extract in just a moment. Um, so there's some overall familiarity, I suppose, and how they're structuring things and how they're using these documents to download the next stage. Now, uh, with these documents, as, as Emotet has used um, Office documents in the past, they're used to gain that initial foothold onto a system. So the, the end goal with these documents, these OneNote docs, is that it's going to download a payload, in this case, their DLLs, um, and execute those, and that's where the actual malware will come from. So we're just going to look at the actual OneNote. Okay, first things first, I'm going to go ahead and um, get the hash there just so I don't forget and so that you can clearly see that. I'll make sure to add these hashes to the video description though as I do for most videos. That way if you want to grab this from the Malware Bazaar, you can go ahead and do that, download it, no problems, and uh, follow along. Next up, we'll use OneDump.py. I won't get all to the details of OneDump. Um, I've covered that in previous videos. Uh, suffice it to say that we just have to provide it with the path to our document and that that will give us essentially this table of contents. Now, um, we have three streams here and the one that is of most interest is stream one. That is because we have the, the, the less than job. So that would appear to be some sort of a script. So we'll define the stream. So dash S1 dash D dumps and dash O will um, produce that as an output file. And then once we've done that, I'm gonna go ahead and open up this file using Visual Studio Code. Okay, um, Visual Studio Code, we've got syntax highlighting. And I think for this particular file, it's, it's, it's very helpful. And because we can see not only when, when looking at the code, but also in the thumbnail view, that there is you know kind of a pattern, a structure to this that is repeating, and, and it is. Um, when you look at these string values, and, and typically when analyzing a script like this, that's one of the first things I'm looking for. Where is the strings? Because the strings usually represent the, the next stage, whether that's another script or that's the executable. It's you know, usually something important. Um, these strings appear to be obfuscated. And if you, if you look at this structure, right, we have this variable um, starting with an F, it's assigned to itself plus the string value. And if we just double click, you can, you, can, you can visually parse this and see how that value is highlighted over and over and over again. And as we scroll down and just kind of pick an arbitrary spot to stop, you'll see again, here we have that same pattern. It's, it's concatenating itself and then adding another string. Now, if you look at what happens next, and a lot of times what you'll see for obfuscation in these documents is not only how are these strings obfuscated, but then you know, unnecessary or junk statements. For example, this, this variable here is assigned a value, it's itself essentially just as a string, and it's not used again. You know, and if, if you don't know 100%, what I'll do sometimes is just copy that, uh, open up find, and see how many instances show up. In this case, there's two because you have the variable and the value. So that tells me that's a pretty good indication that that's just junk. Um, now, I don't, I'm not going to, for this demo, take the time to, to parse that information out. I don't think it helps really at this point of analysis. For me, it just is like a mental note that I can now start to, to mentally ignore those. From here, you'll see that this, um, this variable is assigned the string, but then it is this, this mid function is used to grab from the seventh character in four characters. And if we count those out, That'll be this backslash OCW. You'll also notice as we highlight that, that you see that pattern repeat over and over and over again in all those strings. And this is a very common pattern that I've observed, um, you know, throughout the years with the Imatet is as a way of, you know, padding this, uh, you know, whatever this next stage is, this PowerShell script or this VB script, um, just to, to break up those strings. And then this value can be, it can just be art. It's completely arbitrary. 
Um, and sometimes it gets recursive in that it, there are several passes of removing you know, a, a particular token before this, this sort of valid string emerges. Um, but that's what that, this, uh, this, this, this function is assigning. And then it's splitting that value on that, that token um, and essentially going, going through that array of split values. So it'll be all of these characters, such as the 40599, 39588, 37476 in this loop, right? So this, the split is assigning each one of those into this array. And then this, right, this loop is just going for, to the upper bounds. So it's just going through each element and converting it to a long, dividing it by 347, converting it to a character, concatenating it with this variable, and then doing this in a loop. Now, the problem with this is kind of similar to those previous variables. If you look at well, where is this actually being used? You'll see that there's, okay, well, there's four instances and part of that is it's in another string. So really the, the variable here is never used once it exits this loop. So is this loop, you know, is there a purpose to it or, or a benefit to it for the context of the script? I, I would say no. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for where this code is executed. And, you know, more times than not, I would say, anecdotally, I would say, it comes towards the end of the script, towards the end of the thing that is dealing with the obfuscated code will be the state where it's deobfuscated and can be executed. And looking for, you know, something that's going to invoke that deobfuscated script, such as an execute statement. Um, this variable that we've seen concatenated all the way down from the top, right? It's still being concatenated to at this point. Not only that, but then we're getting the token, we're splitting that, that string into an array, we're iterating that array, doing the same math and, and such that we just talked about. The only difference is that once that is done, this value is now executed, right? So I think we found the spot where we wanted to, to you know, kind of um, dump the script and take a look at the next stage. Okay, a couple things that I've noticed is that sometimes we get uh, syntax errors, and I think the easiest thing to do is just to cut out code that is really not necessary. So I'm going to take out those opening tags and those closing tags, and then with this, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to just add a, a basically a print statement, wscript.echo, and I'm going to copy that in its entirety so that way I don't I can hopefully eliminate any any sort of syntax errors. Okay, so we're we're you know, making the script so that it's not going to execute the next stage, or at least we're I'm fairly confident of at this point. You know, and that's not always going to be the case. Sometimes this logic can be a lot more convoluted, a little bit more difficult to follow along. But you know, if we look for execute statements or any other method, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. You can see there's only one. Um, there's a lot of different ways to execute code dynamically, and so those are the things that we're looking for. And in this particular example, it just happened to be execute. It's only once and, you know, outside of these concatenations, the rest of the code in here is, is by and large junk. Okay, so how can we get the script dumped? Okay, well, again, I, I say this in a lot of videos, there's a number of ways that you could do this, a lot of ways that you could make the analysis go quicker. For example, we could have just thrown this in a sandbox and seen the results. We could just run the script and use Procmon to capture the results. But I like to get into a little bit of the details, talk about a little bit of the analysis, because sometimes it is required. There's anti-analysis, or as you'll see in a minute, there is um, you know, some additional you know, intelligence that you can derive and, and gather from it. Okay, um, in order to execute the script, I'm gonna use Cscript, that's the console script, that's going to just take those print statements, that one print statement anyway, and that will print this to the, that would print that, any of that content to the console here. If we were to use W script, then a window would pop. That's less useful and helpful because with the, the content coming to the console, the standard out, we can redirect that to a file. So I'm gonna do that. And then from here, we'll open up the, what I called s2.txt. Okay, and now that we've extracted our script, we have you know our, arguably the most important information here. And that's the URLs that are going to be utilized to download the next stage. Um, there's not a, you know, a terrible lot of obfuscation at this point. There's some, you know, minorly annoying things like building strings and, and using the, the char code. Um, this look appear to be reg serve uh, 32, and then this will be likely used as you can see here 
with the path to the, the whatever DLL was downloaded and the name that it was given. Um, so, you know, there's some good network signatures here with the user agent, although again, I, I don't know how often this is changing in these campaigns. Um, you know, the, the path, the location that the DLLs are being dropped to, and then the temp name. I don't know off the top of my head how this is generating names, but it might be something worth looking into if you were monitoring those locations. Um, the rest of the document here, again, just kind of, or the rest of the script just goes on to, to implement that functionality of, of reaching out to the internet, um, you know, checking the size of the payload, if it's large enough. Uh, I think that's how it's doing it anyway. Usually that's how it's doing it. Uh, I don't know if that's the check, but um, you know, typically if the response size is large enough, that would indicate then that it's the payload that they're after and, and then they'll try to execute that. You know, typically these will stop after the first payload has been downloaded. And uh, so you know, getting into these scripts is one way to you know, get all of the values. And if, then if you can automate that, which you know, in the past and with these certainly is, is, a, is a possibility um, to extract the script from the OneNote and then to decode this stage and then you know, kind of grep out these, uh, these URLs. Um, so that can be something that can be helpful as well. Um, so here's the document itself. And as you can see, it's just a, you know, a, a variation on the, the overall theme, the overall pattern and trends of how these documents have, have been abused. And that there is you know, some level of, of social engineering. There's actual images here, these abusing the OneNote brand themselves, and they're hiding you know, uh, layered on top of the actual scripts and other things that the authors want someone to double click on as, as instructed here and execute them. And then that, that whole chain of events will take off like we just analyzed. So that's it for the, the way that these OneNote docs are being abused currently. Uh, if you have any questions, feedback, comments, would love to hear from you. Comments are open. Otherwise, I'll talk to you all in the next video.